100, literally, but now we're currently just running the files off it on the laptop. So you'll just have to trust me that this all works perfectly fine on the mobile device. All right, so this is about too quick for mobile UIs. I'll start by quickly mentioning about me. I'm a software engineer who was a troll tech, which became Nokia, and I've worked on, uh, started with Qtopia back in troll tech. And I've been there for three years. QML is about two and a half years old. That's mostly what I've been working on so far at Nokia. Now about Qt, there's the possibility that some of you may not have heard of it before. Uh, it's a cross-platform GUI toolkit. You'll probably recognize it as the GUI toolkit behind KDE, and which, as you know, is a popular Linux desktop environment. But the other platforms that are going to be of interest here will be the mobile platforms like, say, Mego and the Memo running on the N900. Uh, we have a Brisbane office where I work. This is the one responsible, office responsible for QML and Qt Mobility. That's what we've been working on. And you can be proud to know that those technologies have come out of Brisbane. So now let's go on to Qt Quick. So the backronym for this is the Qt User Interface Construction Kit. And this is a set of technologies we've created for mobile UI development. So one of the key parts of it is QML, the Qt Magic Language, a declarative language that you can use to specify your user interfaces. The Qt Declarative Module, which is a C++ module, part of Qt, that pretty much interprets and compiles the QML language into a actual in-memory object tree like you could have created with C++. And that's what ends up being displayed on screen. And also part of Qt Quick is something that I won't be talking much about because I'm not so much involved, but there's a lot of support for this in Qt Creator. There's support for editing QML files, for visual design, uh, for on-device support. And I hope that we can get something a lot better than the Android situation James was lamenting about earlier. So the whole reason that we created Qt Quick and QML was to provide a solution for writing mobile user interfaces. And so that's why I'm talking about today about the design choices we made to try and make Qt Quick really effective for writing mobile user interfaces in particular. In case no one of you have seen QML, I'll give you a quick example. So this is QML. There's a, um, this rectangle here starts a rectangle element inside the curly braces. You can set properties. This might remind some of you of JSON. Um, and when you set these properties like color, X, Y, this goes through the cute property system and it's the same as setting them, the dynamic properties in C++. So, while it's got a nice interpreted language that JavaScript people can quickly recognize and use, and it's fairly friendly, by the end, it does end up being in sort of the same uh, efficient in-memory structures as we use in C++. Also, we have the same signals and slots you might recognize from C++. This here uh, is a signal handler. It executes this bit of JavaScript when that signal gets emitted. So we're integrating well with the existing Qt concepts. Now, this presentation is written entirely in QML. So that example code is the, creates this. And you can see it's got the specified geometry, color, the animations that were put in here for the state change. And it's all just working there. That's what it does. A more extensive example uh, that I might not have time to show the code for is this same game is one of our oldest examples and it appears to be missing something from not being on the phone. Oh right, you, the, um, it uses a additional module. Uh, extension modules are something easy in QML. This uses an additional module that provides particle elements and that's a separate package I forgot to install on someone else's computer. So, unfortunately, we have no particle effects in this presentation. 
But that was the only part that required it. So one of the sort of factors we've been focusing on is the UI split. Now, with QML, it's very easy and it encourages you to have a clear separation of the UI parts of your application. Now, we can't actually force any developers to use good practices and split out their UI logic, but we do really encourage it with the design and make that very easy for you. So the QML files, those declarative bits, those can contain the user interface and all the user interface logic required to make that work. And then you can have the separate C++ or JavaScript parts being called by the user interface sort of as opaque blocks to do the real data handling and logical part. And this is really important for mobile UI development because there's a lot more need for UI porting in mobile. So if you're going from desktop to mobile, there's a lot more changes required to the UI than if you're trying to port from desktop to desktop. Even if you're going between, say, Linux and Windows, there, it's this all, but the same computer. It has the same user input devices the same monitor and human input devices. Whereas between a desktop and a mobile device like this one, a lot has changed. It's the very rare mobile device to even have a keyboard. Uh, it's got a touch screen with a different aspect ratio. Uh, so it's really quite different. To have a good UI, you pretty much need to rewrite it. And that's why we really try to encourage and help the use case of having a separate UI it doesn't have to be completely different, but you will need at least the human touch to create a separate UI that works well on the different platform. And I believe this is what the um, Kmail people did when they wrote Kmail Mobile with QML. They, I think, were able to save up to 80% of their code with the same C++ library code doing the stuff in the back end. But when they rewrote just the mobile UI using QML that could hook in and use the same code, and that really minimized the amount of rewriting they had to do to go to a completely different user interface platform. But it's not just desktop to mobile. There's a lot of differences between mobile devices. And looking at just the Nokia devices, even just Symbian, Qt is supported on the N95 and the N8. And you'd probably need to write a different UI to get it running on both those devices. I mean, it's cute. You can write the code, and it will compile and run on Linux and both the Symbian phones. But it w in order to have a usable user interface between a keypad slider phone and a capacitive touchscreen phone, you're going to need to do some rewriting. And so we really try and make with QML it easy to have the UI in one little part that you can tweak or rewrite as necessary for a different device, and you're still calling the same C++ code that does the real data processing on all platforms. Because there, you really can write once, deploy everywhere, and it works fine in the back end. But you know, another point to sort of just drive this home is that it really can be just little things that make you want to rewrite the UI. If there's a change in just the DPI, then things like buttons that need to be touchable need to be resized. And you might not want to leave that to the computer as the layouts go everywhere trying to accommodate this. It might just be easier to resize the buttons yourself to something that looks nice and fits on that screen. So another thing, so that's the UI split, making that easy. Another thing that's a bit more mobile specific, uh, though it could also apply to desktop, is performance. But you don't really run into performance constraints on desktop. That's not very common. It's much more common on mobile devices to run into performance constraints where you just can't do everything fast enough to get a smooth user interface. And it's important for the user interface to at least feel smooth and responsive, uh, no matter how pretty it is. It needs to feel smooth and responsive to get that good user experience. So one design choice we made with QML was to go with primitives instead of widgets. Some of you may know the cute widgets. They're very large blocks of functionality that pretty much do everything on every platform. And on the desktop, you can afford that, and it's great convenience. But for the more performance-challenged uh, mobile devices, you can't really afford that. So we have these uh, sort of simple primitives that just do one thing, like the rectangle you saw back there, that just draws a rectangle. There was the mouse area primitive that just does the user input. And by combining these simple and efficient primitives, you can still do everything you want, but it's so much easier 
to be done in an optimized fashion. And that's why we have, in some ways, such a limited set of primitives, why we don't just have particles in there by default for everyone to use, is that we try and stick to the primitives that can really perform well on all the devices, and that's a big performance challenge. So we try and make it so that the rectangle can draw the nice rectangle with all its features fast enough to be part of the UI without ruining the smooth user experience. And that is something that's led us to having just this relatively small set of primitives that just do one thing, but they can do it quickly enough to have a responsive UI. A good example of this is the positioners. So Qt on the desktop has layouts that will resize uh, items intelligently that will try and navigate size hints to get to the optimum size considering how much space it could fit in the other elements. And, and that's great, but it's expensive. So with QML, because we need to run smooth and responsive on mobile devices, we just have the positioners. All they do is they position the X and Y of the items to arrange them in a row or a grid because they can do that fast. And they can do that fast enough to give you a responsive user interface on an embedded device. And when we can do that with layouts, then layouts might join the primitive set as well. But for now, we have to stick to what we can do fast enough for a good user experience. And another point I'll address here is something some people have wondered about. Why do we make the implementation of these primitives private. So all the implementations like rectangle and mouse area are private headers inside Qt that we suggest you not uh, re-implement uh, those subclass and try and use modified versions of because we're not guaranteeing the C++ API. And this gives us the flexibility we th think we may need to really optimize things to get the performance to a great level. Now, Qt has a decent track record on this in the past with uh, the graphics scene improvements in 4.6. There really was a significant speed up. But we're hoping to do even more than that with QML uh, what, because we can leave the QML API intact in public. So that all the stuff from QML, once it gets interpreted, works fine. But we can change the C++ structure so as to make it even faster. An example of this is switching out the back end. So one thing we're currently experimenting with is trying to put this on a completely new scene graph. Now that's a massive implementation change and will probably affect the C++ APIs, but if it works, then we'll get greatly improved performance. And we can keep the QML API the same so that any of the QML applications, like this presentation, will still work just fine, but faster. Another thing that we think really helps with the mobile application development is this sort of interpreted language. Now, it's not really interpreted. It's more just-in-time compiled because, as I said, by the time your application's running, the QML has been turned into an in-memory object tree like you could have gotten with C++. The same Q graphics objects uh, have been instantiated. But because it's written sort of in an interpreted way, there's this easy on-device testing. I didn't have to compile anything when testing this presentation on the N900. I just copied the files over. Since it was an N900, I could even edit the files on it fairly easily with the keyboard. So you can actually try it out on the target device easily without a long compile phase, without, say, having to go down to a lab if they're the only ones who can compile it for you. Um, the interpreted scripting language sort of nature really makes it possible to try the UI on the target device. And because all the devices are so different, you really need to do this. There's a completely different experience trying to use it on something like this with the touch screen uh, compared to, say, my dual widescreen monitors that I normally develop on with uh, a massively powerful computer that can do all those particle effects in an instant. So it really does help to be able to easily put it on device and try it out in the right context because it's just interpreted when you launch it. And even if you have a C++ backend, uh, we support a notion of dummy data in the QML viewer. And the way this works is that the variables you're accessing the C++ backend implementation with can be redirected to some 
fake data, you've written in another QML file, and then you can try on device without having to do any compiling, just copying files over, you can try on device the actual UI with an actual data source being pulled from, and you can try flicking your lists of thousands of contacts or whatever, actually on the device just from copying files over, and then when you switch from dummy data to the real data, once they've finally gotten it to compile for that device, then there's no change to the QML files. It's all exactly as you tested it with, of course, the possibility that your dummy data was not a good test case. And this means it's prototyping friendly. So you can actually start prototyping with QML on the device what you want your user interface to be. You can try it on the device. And unlike a purely prototyping language, once you've finished your prototype, decided that it's working well, you can then use that as the actual UI. You don't have to say, OK, this looks great. Let's try and re-implement it and see if we can do that in C++. You actually have the same prototype you've been working on um, on the device, and you can just reuse that. So this isn't just great for the developers. If you have a separate designer, this is even better. So if, say, uh, sorry, I pick on you, but if James gets his wish and gets a UI designer working on his application, they're not going to write, want to write code like Java or C++ to do the user interface. They're going to want to mock something up in some other tool. And we've tried to make QML friendly enough for them to do that. You've seen the JavaScript-like syntax. Web designers should feel comfortable enough to just go in there and do it. And the designers we've been working with have had no problem with writing the QML themselves. And this way, they're not only prototyping and playing with the design they want, uh, using a technology on the device, but they're doing it with a technology that can be used for the UI. They don't have to go to the programmer and then say, okay, re-implement this in C++ this is how I want it to look. They've written the actual UI, and they've tried it in a real context. They will see, okay, this effect is too slow to work. They will see, oh, on the touch screen, uh, the mouse wheel scrolling doesn't work as well. So. Being able to actually write the UI for designers is something that we've been really aiming for with QML. And to help make it even easier for them, there's an upcoming visual tool as part of Qt Creator, which will hopefully be up to the same sort of standards as Xcode, where you just can drag and drop the elements you want, get a lovely UI, and then stick that in the application. And a final point on the design for mobile, which sort of is more in the evolutionary sense than where we were thinking initially, but we have the Qt Components project that's upcoming. Now, it's not done. It's even pre-alpha right now. But, I mean, it's open source, so you can still play with it. And what this is doing is trying to get sort of the best of both worlds with the uh, components with all that sort of widget-like functionality for each mobile device, but still fast enough and still working integrated with QML um, to get you the native sort of feel and style. So Migo is one thing that we're particularly trying to get this working for. We hope that Migo will be as simple as, say, this to get a button or a checkbox. I mean, it's already even using the uh, colors from Ubuntu here, but... Yes, the Qt Components project aims to make it as simple as just writing button or checkbox to get those elements. You then tweak them as you would with QML. They are designed for the platform, so the Migo ones will be designed to be fast enough on the Migo devices to work well with the Migo sort of user interface constraints and to fit in with the Migo style. So there is an upcoming project that should really help for mobile UI development um, that we're working on with Qt Quick. So I probably a good time now to bring up again that this is free and open source software. Um, the development and source code is all open and up on Gatorius. So here's where you can get the code for Qt Declarative and Qt Quick is all part of Qt. So that's with the main Qt repo. Qt Components is being done in a separate repo, but that's also on Gatorius if you want to check out the latest code there. And that's probably the only place you'll find Qt components at the moment because it's still well before release. Uh, as regards to Qt Quick and QML, we noticed just now that it's 
uh, nicely packaged in Ubuntu. There are packages for the Qt and the declarative module and the QML viewer available on uh, at least 10.10 .10 today if you want to try that out. And uh, from memory, I've also downloaded Fedora packages. It should be in your distribution if you just want to play with QML and Qt quick on a desktop. In case people missed it, Qt is under LGPL, available under LGPL now. Uh, so we have three licensing options to cater for pretty much everyone. I'm sure you'll find something you like. And the Open Governance Project I will mention now. It's moving slowly. You may have heard about it earlier, but we've been working with the community trying to find a best-in-class open governance model. And when this finally gets um, through and implemented, we're hoping to have a sort of uh, best-in-class meritocracy uh, Governance for Qt, where it's the people who make contributions that help determine the direction it goes. And then it will be a truly um, free and open source project. Right now, it's just your standard LGPL and GPL sort of thing. But that still is open enough for any of you to have a look and play around with whatever you like. So, are there any questions about Qt Quick? and or mobile device UIs. Um, how long do you think it will be before we can expect to see Qt available on um, real devices across multiple vendors and in real widespread fashion? All right, well, I mean, real devices, it is on here. This was, in, it was going to, if, if we got it running off here, then, which we only didn't because the audio visual setup didn't seem to want to take the component input, um, if you want, you can come down later and see it running on here. But this is running on here with the packages that are part of the MIMO distribution. So if you want just a real phone, here it is. It's running and working there. As for widespread distribution among multiple vendors, well, uh, all I can say is that Nokia is currently focused on getting it running on Nokia platforms, Mego and Symbian, and we're running, uh, working on distributing it there. Uh, as for other platforms, not my place as a Nokian to say, but it is free and open source software. I have heard that there are Android and even iPhone ports of Qt, and all you need to do to get Qt Quick running on another device would be to port the C++ Qt library to run that device, and Qt Quick is basically only depends on uh, the rest of Qt. It should be fairly easy. I don't know the status of those community ports, but for all I know, they have gotten to that level, and you can already use this on your Android phone. You'll have to look into the community ports for more details. I don't know the status of Cute Quick for Jambi, though. So that, that, that's another community-supported thing that I have not worked on. Yes. So JavaScript engine, and you also mentioned JIT as well. So what is the actual JavaScript engine that you use? The JavaScript engine we're currently using is JavaScript Core. Um, note that we only really use the JavaScript engine for big sort of snippets of JavaScript. So actually even something as simple as this, um, we can take care of ourselves. You can embed full huge chunks or parse entire files of JavaScript. That gets done with JavaScript Core. We have our own uh, engine for reading the QML syntax, which is JavaScript-like in that it's reminiscent of it, but it's not actually JavaScript uh, as a language. It's its own language. What's the memory footprint like? I beg your pardon? What's the memory footprint like? Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but that does come under performance. Probably should have mentioned that we have been trying to keep it fairly lean. The, only, the last um, test we did that I remember was that we were a few megabytes smaller in runtime memory footprint than the same application being run with Qt WebKit. So uh, it's not saying much, but at the very least, we're leaner than HTML5. Well, so what happens is that the, um, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking, will there be a QML compiler to just get a binary out of it? 
Right. Well, basically, what ha what we've got now is that the QML gets compiled into a sort of uh, binary form when the application runs, and we're looking into caching that. It would be theoretically possible for you to dump that out and then read it again yourself later. But we think the most the easiest thing for you end users would be if uh, we just add the ability to transparently cache it. The first time you run the application, it does the compiling, and then later it accesses the compiled cache. Well, if you don't want anyone tampering with it, then the solution for that is to compile the QML files into the binary with the Qt resource system. So it's uh, just a couple of lines to create a C++ application that loads a QML file for the UI and stuff. And it's, uh, well, uh, maybe not even any lines, really, with Qt Creator to get it uh, to compile all the QML files and stuff into the binary with the Qt resource system, and then you have to break open the binary in order to edit those files. Yes? Uh, there's one more question up there. <laughs> if I... May I install the particles plugin so as to... <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the um, same game is not the only. There we are. Um, I have no idea what. You will need to do this, I think. Lim. Maybe we should come see the same game on the phone. It's a little more impressive there, I think, because playing... Well, I'm sure we've already got a same game we can play on this computer. So is it working now? Uh, which... Where was that uh, shell? Sorry, I wasn't ready for... Oh, I might need to restart the application here. Backslash, yeah. Sorry. Okay, let's see if it's working now. There we go. So it's um, was this one was sized for the N900 screen, so you can still actually tap on the individual objects. But this is entirely written with QML and JavaScript. Uh, if we took out the high score functionality that you won't be seeing here anyway. It was under 300 lines. Without that, that, um, that functionality was to have web-enabled pulling and pushing of high scores from a server. Um, but this, this is entirely with Qt and QML, JavaScript for the game logic in a separate file. Uh, there's the score buttons and, of course, objects that you can interact with for the game part with complete particles and animations. So here's one example of something you can easily do with Qt Quick, and I'll be happy to show anyone later that it works just fine on a mobile device. And that's really the important thing here. And you can also try and beat my high score, but that's kind of tough. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Thank you, by the way. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much to Alan.